A few weeks ago, space security issues took center stage in the news after reports came out that Russia is working on a nuclear anti-satellite weapon. This raised a lot of questions. What would a nuclear weapon mean in space? Why would Russia pursue this? In this week's On Orbit episode, we dig into these questions with Dr. Brian Wheaton, Chief Program Officer of the Secure World Foundation, an organization that works to promote secure, sustainable, and peaceful uses of outer space. Whedon is an expert on space security issues, and he conducts research on issues like space debris, protecting space assets, and space governance. He explains the physical and geopolitical consequences of detonating a nuclear weapon in space, and how this situation has raised awareness of security issues in space. Before we get into the discussion, a quick note that this is the last episode to come out before Satellite 2024. I'll be interviewing Intelsat CEO David Wajgras during the Monday lunch keynote and running a panel with telco execs to talk about their relationship with satellite in a Wednesday session on the exhibit hall floor in the VIA Satellite Theater. Hope to see you there. As an OnOrbit listener, you can use VIP code ONORBIT24 to claim a free exhibit hall pass to satellite. Register at satshow.com. I'm Rachel Jewett, and you're listening to On Orbit, the podcast that asks, what's our future in space? Hi, Brian. Welcome to the On Orbit podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, a few weeks ago, there was news about Russia developing a nuclear space weapon, and I thought you would be the perfect person to, to talk to about this. Um, the Secure World Foundation focuses on space security, peaceful use of outer space. You have written and researched on these issues for years, and you were also quoted by the Washington Post about this story. So thanks for joining. Uh, it's my pleasure. I, those were those were an interesting couple of days. I was talking to quite a few reporters uh, about uh, some of the issues I think we'll get to in, in detail on this. Yeah, yeah. So to kind of give our listeners some background, and, you know, I'm sure many of you read about this in the news. And in mid-February, there's Republican Congressman Mike Turner, who put out a statement about a serious national security threat asking for President Biden to declassify the information. But the message was kind of cryptic. He didn't say what the threat was. And there was reporting that it was a nuclear, um, that Russia wanted to put a nuclear weapon in space. So the White House responded with the National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby addressing it. Um, He confirmed that Russia is developing an anti-satellite capability, but he said that it's not active at this point, and he did not address whether or not it is nuclear. Um, But, you know, anti-satellite weapons, that's not new. Russia tested one in 2021. So I think I'll just start out by asking you, you know, what was your immediate reaction as this was playing out when you first heard about the whether it was a space threat, a nuclear space threat, what was your initial reaction? Uh, my initial reaction was one of confusion because I think we all know that detonating a nuclear weapon in outer space is, is going to be a terrible tragedy, and certainly no one could be crazy enough to, to think about trying to do that. And so I, I and, and others spent quite a lot of time trying to talk to the reporters, talking with other people, trying to figure out what was really going on here because there was so little information. And I think our immediate reaction was, well, by nuclear, this must mean something rather than nuclear power, a nuclear reactor. Uh, and it, that is certainly plausible. We do an annual open source global counterfeit capabilities report. And, and we've talked about in there in detailed evidence that Russians are working on a couple of programs to build satellites that use nuclear reactors to power like an electronic weapons payload, electronic warfare payload that would do some sort of jamming interference. So that's something real that that might be happening. And so our immediate assumption was, well, the word nuclear must have gotten garbled, that they probably meant this. And then as the story went on and as, you know, we got a little bit more information, uh, you know, the the major outlets got a couple of sources uh, who said, nope, this is a nuclear weapon, not a nuclear power. And then you had Kirby's briefing that you mentioned, where he explicitly said that if this was deployed, it would be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty. And the only explicit prohibition 
in the Outer Space Treaty is thou shall not place weapons of mass destruction, i.e. nuclear weapons, in space, on orbit, <laughs> uh, uh, on the moon, or other celestial bodies. Mm-hmm. And so those two things together sort of caused us to kind of recalibrate and, wow, maybe they are thinking about some sort of a weapon that is based around a nu- uh, uh, detonating a nuclear bomb. Mm-hmm. Which, again, it's possible. It just would have some some pretty devastating consequences for everyone, including Russia. Yes, right. So when you say the kind of worst case nuclear weapon in space, would this be something that would detonate in orbit? So not something that they would launch like from space to Earth. That That's the indication. So again, preface this by saying yeah. there's still extremely limited information about this uh, that, that's outside the classified domain. But But yes, so launching a nuclear weapon on a ballistic missile up into space and detonating it would not violate the Outer Space Treaty. It is the only thing that the explicit prohibition is on the placement, i.e. it's achieved orbit, it's in orbit in some capacity. So so that's why, you know, we're thinking now along those lines. Um, and and so that, that's bad for two reasons. One, detonating a nuclear weapon as the United States discovered ourselves in 1962 is really bad. We did something called Starfish Prime. It was one of many nuclear tests uh, that we and the Soviets did in the 60s, 50s, 60s uh, time period. This one in particular, we detonated a 1.4 megaton weapon uh, at um, uh, about 400 kilometers and discovered there was a lot of bad effects. Uh, It interfered with the power grids in Hawaii. It took out several satellites right away, and then a bunch more satellites uh, over the next few weeks and months as the radiation released by the weapon pumped up the naturally occurring Van Allen radiation belts uh, and caused a bunch more satellites to prematurely fail. Uh, A significant percentage of all the satellites on orbit. Now, it was only maybe a couple of dozen, but still, it was not not great. So we we know it's bad, and and we haven't done that. Um, There are... Cold War era uh, uh, bilateral agreements between the U.S. and Soviet Union, uh, now Russia, not to test nuclear weapons in the atmosphere or in mm-hmm. outer space. And then, of course, as I mentioned, there's the prohibition in the Outer Space Treaty on placement of nuclear okay. weapons in orbit. So talk to me a little bit more about what it would mean in the worst case scenario if Russia detonated a nuclear weapon in space, what would it do? Uh, the question is, what wouldn't it do? Um, well, first off, you know, let's think about the, some of the physics of this. Uh, there is no concussion wave. There is no blast wave. There's no mushroom cloud because mm-hmm. there's no atmosphere in space to convey those right. things. So you detonate a nuclear weapon in outer space, you get a flash, uh, you get a, an immediate transmission of energy across the electromagnetic spectrum from visible, uh, infrared, all the way up to gamma and x-rays. And then you have the the particles, the radioactive particles that are being emitted. Um, and some of that has sudden effects, some of it has long-term effects. On the sudden effects side, anything with a camera that is looking in the direction and it's sensitive to those wavelengths mm-hmm. could be damaged or could mm-hmm. be blinded. Uh, satellites that are relatively nearby could be uh, absorb the thermal infrared pulse, uh, and that could cause them to overheat, uh, cause significant damage. Uh, and then there is the, and then there is this other immediate effect known as an electromagnetic pulse, which is an interesting side effect of detonating nuclear weapons. It essentially creates a, an electrical overload that can then propagate through electrical circuits um, close by and also fairly distance away. So that is what what the effect they found out on Hawaii, where the, the the energy surge from the nuclear detonation way up in space caused an electrical surge through the power grid and power lines and telephone lines that damaged a bunch of bunch of equipment and damaged some things. So that's the uh, that's the other uh, yeah. near term effect. So you know th- those three things could wipe out a pretty significant portion of satellites in the immediate blast. But then you have all the radiation energy being released 
pumps up these naturally occurring Van Allen radiation belts. And, and while some satellites are designed to, to survive in those for certain periods of time, if they now become much more uh, powerful, much more concentrated, then those satellites are going to die much quicker. Uh, and so over weeks and months, you could see a significant portion of satellites in space uh, uh, just failing because mm -hmm. of, of this attack. Yeah. Now, it's important to keep in mind that this would be indiscriminate, right? This would affect everything in orbit uh, in the region where it's targeted at. So if it's detonated in low Earth orbit, it would generally affect things in low Earth orbit, might have some effects in higher orbits. And similarly, if it's detonated up near GEO, would definitely affect things in geo might have some other implications for things lower down and it would affect not only u.s stuff but russian chinese european everybody's stuff yeah it would affect it would affect their own capabilities absolutely and that's sort of been one of the reasons why after starfish prime pretty much no one really thought about this as a serious thing to do uh, because if you're trying to fight a war and you want to use space or you want to be able to use space after it's all done with, it's not really all that useful from a military perspective. Right. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on whether hypothetically this weapon, they would want to target Leo or Geo? Yeah, that's a little unclear. I think my guess would be more of Geo for two reasons. Okay. One, if you wanted to go after Leo, I don't see why you'd place it in orbit versus just putting it on a ballistic missile, launching into space and detonating it. Right. It's a lot, it's a lot harder to defend that way. And you don't have to worry about it being on orbit and somebody noticing it or, or, or something going wrong with triggering it. Mm -hmm. The other reason is, you know, the, if, if you're thinking about where the bulk of important NASCAR satellites are, uh, it's in the geostationary region. There's a lot of uh, missile warning, signals intelligence, other kinds of intelligence collection satellites, communication satellites that are there. Two counterpoints, though. One, a lot of the existing military satellites are likely hardened against EMP and potentially nuclear blast, at least a lot of the military ones. Two, there is an argument that this could be a way to go after the large constellations in Leo, which are proving to be real strategic challenges for Russia. Things yes. like Starlink and, and others that are coming online in the near future are, 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 you know, Starlink certainly being used by the Ukrainians to great effect um, in Europe, sorry, in, in the war going on in Ukraine. And, you know, Russia has tried a lot of things to disrupt it. There's reports of them playing all kinds of electronic warfare and jamming and cyber attacks. And as far as we can tell, so far, it's not had a huge uh, impact. Um, and so if you detonate a weapon that takes out thousands of satellites in one fell swoop, maybe they think that is a way to do it. But again, I don't understand why you would need to do that by placing it in orbit versus just putting a nuclear weapon on a ballistic missile and launching it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Starlink could be part of definitely part of the calculus of what Russia would want to achieve. Uh, that, that yes. We know that Starlink and future large broadband constellations are something they are very concerned about. Mm -hmm. We just don't know if this is one potential response. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a weird question, pros and cons. It sounds like what I'm hearing from you is that the cons outweigh what if if you look at it in a logical way, the downsides outweigh a absolutely what could be seen as a, a strategic advantage to do it. Absolutely correct. Uh you know you may have some long-term advantages in taking out some particular space capabilities, but it would be hard to tell who's or sorry to tell which ones. Uh, again, it would affect everyone's in space, including Russian satellites, the International Space Station, Chinese satellites. Uh, it would be pretty devastating. So I, I guess there maybe is an argument that this is sort of, a, you know, for those who have who remember their, their Dr. Strange love, right, sort of a 
you know, a doomsday kind, kind of a weapon, um, to use the last resort, but I'm honestly hard pressed to, to, to find, you know, what, how useful that would be, especially as the movie pointed out, if you don't tell anybody you have it, right. Mm -hmm. You know, if your goal is some sort of new of deterrence through this, you know, Hey, don't do this, or we'll threaten to do this. Um, and you don't tell anybody that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know if that was the intent or not. We don't know if this was meant as a as as a deterrence thing. We don't know if it was meant to actually be used. Again, we don't even really know what it is. There's right. just a lot of speculation here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on like how this got into the public domain? Of is like it seemed a little odd to me that it would come from a congressman, kind of putting out that this hinting at the sort of information that i don't know any thoughts on how this happened yeah you know we don't we don't really know a whole lot there i mean we do know that you know russian and chinese counter space capabilities have been an area of high priority for both the executive branch and the legislative legislative branch the last 10 years or more uh there's likely been a lot of classified briefings uh we certainly know there are national intelligence estimates, for example, that are done on this topic regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we know quite a bit about it in the open source, and I'm certain there's a whole lot more details happening uh, in the classified world behind closed doors. There's been some speculation that the reason uh, he went he went public with this uh, was because it was related to the, the trying to get the, the House to vote on the Ukraine mm -hmm. support. Um, Others suggested that it may be linked to reauthorization of some of the intelligence uh, collection uh, things. Um, I think uh, 702 is up for reauthorization again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot of sort of inside the beltway reading of the yeah. tea leaves might be plausible, you know, hard to tell what's actually real. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you mentioned, you, you talked about the Outer Space Treaty. So, this would be a complete violation of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, do you think that, like, how invested do you think Russia is in the Outer Space Treaty right now? Well, up until recently, I would say they're pretty invested. You know, they were one of the original two space superpowers and led the negotiations uh, along with the United States on the Outer Space Treaty and were huge players in its drafting um, and its ratification. And ever since have been extremely strong supporters uh, of the Outer Space Treaty in all international fora and, and you know multilateral level discussions. Russia has also, over the last 40 years or so, gone to great lengths to uh, you know, cast the United States as being against the Outer Space Treaty, trying to weaponize space, trying to undermine the, the premise of the peaceful uses of outer space. And that's, again, that's been consistent for nearly 40 years now. So for then the Russians to go ahead and, and, and I'll repeat, the one explicit prohibition that is in there is do not place weapons of mass destruction in orbit. Uh, for them to go ahead and plan to do that, uh, is 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 it's relatively shocking. I mean, obviously, you know, okay. given yeah. what's going on in Ukraine and other areas that they've 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 shown a, a willingness to ignore and violate international law. But again, this is a case where they have built over decades a a diplomatic consistency on one aspect. And if they if they were actually to do this, it would just destroy that entire uh edifice they have built. Yeah, that's that's pretty serious. What about defense? Um, the U.S. defend itself against something like this? Is it just is it deterrence? Uh, what is what is what do we know about the defense landscape? Which I'm sure a lot of uh, capabilities are classified. <laughs> how much time do we have for this? Uh, so th this could be potentially a long discussion. I mean. On, on the one level, you know these these kinds of weapons are 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 not really defendable, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just like yeah. how do you defend against a nuclear weapon on Earth? 
well, you might try and do some missile defense, but it turns out that's really hard to do. And in general, we've decided just to threaten the other person with nuclear weapons and hope nobody is stupid enough to, to, you know, to actually go down that path and everyone in the world dies. In space, that, that's a much harder thing to do because the United States is far more reliant on space than pretty much anyone else is. Uh, Russians certainly use space, uh, and, and China is, is, is rapidly increasing its space capabilities, but neither of them is as dependent as the United States, at least for the time being. Mm-hmm. Which I think China may be in, in the near future, but but at least the time being, no one's in space. So it's really hard to have a similar sort of tit-for-tat threat model when it comes to deterring attacks on space, which is why there's such a big concern about attacks on satellites, counterfeits weapons in general, uh, aside for, from, from the nuclear question. So the way you then defend against it is through what we generally, you know, just normal kind of coming up with defenses. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we thought about this a lot during the Cold War because there was a presumption that armed conflict would, be ha- would include use of nuclear weapons on the ground and in space. And so, you know, historically, the U.S., has built military space systems that were designed to operate during an armed conflict to be, uh, you know, resistant uh, at the very least to electromagnetic pulse um, and and other nuclear effects. We don't know if any of the current systems are, uh, as a taxpayer, I'd like to believe that at least some of them are, especially the ones like, you know, the, the missile defense, missile warning, nuclear command and control, um, uh, you know, the GPS satellites, which have a nuclear detection role. You'd like to think they all are, but we don't know that for certain. And, and also, we don't know how much you can actually do in that regard, right? Mm-hmm. Is, it, is it a mitigation? Is it making it harder? Or can you actually outright protect against that kind of stuff? Um, I'll just say on the ground side of it, we do have a little bit more information because it turns out that uh, the kinds of EMP effects that you might get from this for detonation space are in some way similar to some of the more severe space weather effects that we've seen. Oh, uh, yeah. And some of the high latitude countries, places like uh, Norway, Finland, uh, Quebec, uh, Northern Canada, have had to deal with EMP from space weather on their power grids. And we do know how to mitigate against some of those things. And Department of Homeland Security has done some of that. So when it comes to the terrestrial impacts, we we do have a little bit better idea of what we can do. Interesting. Very interesting. Hmm. Okay. So um, do you think that this makes the Space Development Agency's investment in the the PWSA even more critical? Like it might not be I, I don't know if the PWSA would be relevant in this exact situation, but, um, so the, I think so. And, and that's because the, what the SDA is doing is a different approach to building out space architectures. Classically, the way the military did things was they bought a few numbers of very large, very expensive, very capable satellites, one, two, six, maybe 10 of them. Yep. Uh, and, and they were built, they were designed, built over several years and then put on orbit and expected the last decades. Mm-hmm. What the, what, what SDA is doing is, is pretty radically different. And it's a, we're going to, it's what we call a distributed, distributed proliferated approach where, where they're going to build constellations of hundreds to thousands of satellites that are individually per unit, much cheaper, much quicker to build. And they be refreshed on a every few years basis, as opposed to staying on over a long time. Very much the way that industry is going. We've seen the Starlink, OneWeb, Planet, lots of other satellite operators have, have gone that way. I think that helps in part because if you if there is an attack and you lose a bunch of satellites, you can reconstitute much more quickly. You can replace them much quicker. Um, you know, you're not you don't have to worry about an attack that takes out one of your two satellites or two of your three satellites. You've got hundreds, you've got thousands, Mm -hmm. you can do that. On the other hand, uh, you know, this type, uh, a a nuclear detonation is one of the types of weapons that would be able to probably damage large numbers of satellites 
uh, again, it would just do so indiscriminately and would affect the you know everybody's satellite space, not yeah. just the one particular country you're going after. Would that would that lead to debris, or would the satellites like burn up? Um, in, in general, they're going to fail on orbit and become big pieces of debris. Okay, and and then eventually they would re-enter the atmosphere. At least at least if they were in low Earth orbit, they would eventually re-enter the atmosphere and, and likely burn up in the atmosphere. So no, uh, in general, the effects I talked about the uh, the 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 optical flash, the thermal pulse, um, the EMP, and then the the pumped up radiation belts. None of those are likely to, you know, destroy us and fragment. Okay, satellite. so it's not going to be like a Kessler. It's not going to tee off. No, a well, not immediately. No, um, but if you then result in hundreds or thousands of satellites that are just dead and they're just floating around like pieces, the big piece of debris, they could always end up colliding with other things. Uh, and, and honestly, that's what Don was worried about in his very first paper, right? Was debris on debris collisions that mm -hmm. generate new debris and, and, and it cascades over over decades uh, in, in, into the future. So yeah. it certainly is not going to help. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, remind people that the movie Gravity was sort of the Hollywoodization of this, right? You know, mm -hmm. where all this happened in five minutes. Yeah. That's not the way it happened in reality, right? This is a, the Kessler syndrome is an effect that happens over decades to centuries. It doesn't happen in five whole minutes. Yeah. But, you know, detonating something like this in space and taking out hundreds of thousands of satellites is certainly not going to help. And it's probably going to make it much worse. Mm -hmm. Man, gravity really led me astray on what that would look like. <laughs> I mean, it's Hollywood, right? I mean, yeah. if you look at anything they do, they always kind of pump up the drama and they don't like things that, that you know, you got to sit around and wait for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. So um, I wanted to ask from the perspective of commercial satellite operators, I don't know how much they can do, but how... How concerned should commercial satellite operators be? You know, you're right. I, for this particular thing, I don't think there's anything they can do. I mean, there's not a whole lot the government, the militaries can do, uh, especially since hardening your satellite against these sort of effects and things like the EMP and the radiation yeah. is super expensive. And and it's typically something commercial operators don't really, um, don't really do. It doesn't make sense for them to invest in. I do think this signals that the commercial industry should think about having a stronger voice in some of these national security discussions. Yeah. We started having, we started, you know, talking about that several years ago and the response we got from, from a lot of companies was, well, it doesn't really affect us or that's just, you know, geopolitics and, you know, we're just here to do our business. But increasingly as we're seeing from things like destructive anti-satellite testing and potentially, you know, these new things of the nuclear space, that could destroy your business. That could absolutely impact your ability to make money in space and to run a profitable business over the long term. So, you know, it, it's it's going to be it's hard because this is a new area. You know, there's not always venues for the commercials to get engaged. But I do think they should, you know, think about having a stronger voice in some of the discussions at the very least at the national level, um, because you know the U.S. government is thinking about what what its capabilities, what its strategies, what its plans will be for future armed conflict defense in outer space. Maybe there's aspects of those plans that are, I would say, not always compatible with where industry commercial wants to go. But then more broadly, the more talk there is of warfare in space and destroying all these satellites, I think that might have an impact on investors, insurers, those type of things. So, so maybe, maybe it's time for the space industry to get engaged. Yeah, the I mean the whole promise of a like booming space economy is ha needs a safe environment for that to take place. You know, investors aren't going to be throwing a bunch of money at stuff that could become or is likely to become a war zone. Um yeah, it's, I think it has a lot of implications for, but but like you said, there isn't that much that commercial operators can do, but I appreciate you asking for them to be more engaged um, on a national scale and talking about these issues more. You know, I think, you know, engaging with policymakers, uh, making your voices heard, 
talking about how this stuff might impact, I think that could all be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this was a situation that kind of raised the profile of space security concerns. It absolutely did. Uh, <laughs> it got a lot of reporters and, and quite a fair bit of the public uh, and, and many politicians uh, quite concerned. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, are you losing sleep at night or should regular people be losing sleep at night? <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the, we don't want to get too overhyped on this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there, were, there were several uh, congressional representatives, and I think uh, uh, even the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan himself, said, look, this is a problem, but it's not deployed yet. It's, not, it's still in development. Uh, so this is not something to worry about right away. Um, and also, I think the, the White House clarified that this would not be posed a threat to people on Earth. Right? This, is a, yeah. this would be a threat to, to things in space. So we do have that going for us, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as someone who works in works in this space and deals with these issues, you know, I, I, I do think about it and, and we are looking at how can we reinforce the existing international laws on this, uh, the country's commitment to upholding those and, and kind of encouraging, well, helping convince all countries that, this is just not a good thing to do, and there's not really a benefit, um, and it would be it would be devastating for everyone. Yeah, so you guys are like really a leading voice and a facilitator on these types of issues. Um, so, is there anything like specific that are you guys talking about? Any specific actions or doing anything? Uh, I don't know differently or new initiatives to respond to this. Well. Not directly on this, but yeah. I think we'll probably bring it into some of the things we've been doing. Uh, we've been, you know, we care about security uh, conflict issues in space primarily because of the impact they would have on space sustainability, on our ability to use space into the future. So we've been engaging uh, through several different processes within the United Nations for countries to get together and talk about this and figure out a way to, to move forward. There was a process that wrapped up last year. Uh, it's called this open-ended working group on space threats that we were involved with. And, and now there's going to be another one next year. That's continued discussion. My, my colleague was just in New York uh, at the UN last week to kind of give our position on that. Uh, and, you know, we're part of that, we're, we're thinking about what are the things we can all agree on that we can maybe come together and create not only a norm, but potentially um, new, new treaties, new agreements. Mm -hmm. The one, honestly, that comes up is not necessarily this, because this, again, it's already in the outer space, outer space treaty, but destructive anti-satellite testing in general. Yes. Uh, we, we've been sort of promoting the moratorium the United States led, and, and now there's a couple dozen countries uh, involved. We help put together a uh, industry statement of, of a couple of dozen companies that have all said, we think this is a good idea and we think there should not be testing in orbit. Uh, and, and I think that's, we put that together at the end of last year. And we're still having a few companies that are trickling every month or two that say, hey, we'd like to add our names uh, to this list. We think this is an important uh, uh, thing to support, an important norm to start creating. So we're definitely involved with those. And, and we're always thinking about you know, how do we move the the conversation forward? Mm -hmm. What kinds of discussions do we need to involve to to put together? What kind of stakeholders do we need to involve? You know, because we we do have that goal of ensuring long term sustainable use of space for benefits on Earth. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for joining the show. It was it was great to talk through this issue with you. I uh, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.